Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of The Stars Like Dust by Isaac Asimov. It says on the rear, Asimov at his best. Overnight, young Byron Farrell changed from a casual student preparing for graduation at the University of Earth into a fugitive fleeing from an unknown assassin. Someone had tried to kill him in his dormitory, and he learned that, many light years away in the inky blackness of the Horsehead Nebula, his father had already been murdered. The mystery, took him into, the mystery took him deep into space where he found himself in a relentless struggle with the power-mad despots of Turan. It was a case of death or freedom for the galaxy. No full stop at the end. Not the best blurb, to be honest. Written in a weird tense. Like, that's... It implies that all of the stuff that actually happens in this story had already happened before the story, which isn't quite accurate. But yeah, I'm going to go through and check out some of my uh, tabs, and then I'm going to share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So the first thing I noticed in this, and I thought this was super cute, the dedication to his wife. To Gertrude, to whom I have been, at the moment, very contentedly married for eight years, one month, two weeks, one day, two hours, 45 minutes, and a few seconds. This bit made me chuckle. Very well, I imagine. Very well. I imagine, Farrell, that you know me to be a fellow countryman from the Nebula Kingdoms, although I've been passing myself off as a vegan. I think it's actually pronounced vegan. And it doesn't mean that they don't eat animal products, unfortunately. I thought this was interesting too, because here space flight kind of reflects just regular flight. Um, and uh, yeah, it also reflects the time it was written in, I think. So this is the start of chapter three, Chance and the Wristwatch. The first hour of a spaceship's rise from planetary thraldom is the most prosaic. There is the confusion of departure, which is much the same in essence as that which must have accompanied the shoving off of the first hollowed out tree trunk on some primeval river. You have your accommodations, your luggage is taken care of, there is the first stiff moment of strangeness and meaningless hustle surrounding you, the shouted last minute intimacies, the quieting, the muted clang of the airlocks, followed by the slow softening of air as the locks screw inward automatically, like, like, like gigantic drills becoming airtight. Then the portentous silence and the red signs flicking in every room. Adjust acceleration suits. Adjust acceleration suits. Adjust acceleration suits. The stewards scour the corridors, knocking shortly on each door and jerking it open. Beg pardon, suits on. You battle with the suits, cold, tight, uncomfortable, but cradled in a hydraulic system which absorbs the sickening pressures of the takeoff. There is the faraway rumble of the atom-driven motors, on low power for atmospheric manoeuvring, following instantly by the well, that's a typo. Followed instantly, it should say, by the giving back against the slow yielding oil of the suit cradle. You recede almost indefinitely back, then very slowly forward again as the acceleration decreases. If you survive, no if you survive nausea during this period, you're probably safe from space sickness for duration. And there we get this voice over the amplifiers. This is another thing I thought fascinating. I don't know, just sometimes I really enjoy like the physics and stuff behind it, especially because Asimov knew his stuff, you know? The voice over the amplifiers was clear and well balanced in the gathered choir. Ladies, gentlemen, we are ready for our first jump. Most of you, I suppose, know, at least theoretically, what a jump is. Many of you, however, more than half in point of fact, have never experienced one. It is to those last I would like to speak in particular. The jump is exactly what the name implies. In the fabric of space-time itself, it is impossible to travel faster than the speed of light. That is a natural law, first discovered by one of the ancients, the traditional Einstein perhaps, except that so many things are credited except that so many things are credited to him. Even at the speed of light, of course, it would take years in resting time to reach the stars. Therefore one leaves the space-time fabric to enter the little known realm of hyperspace, where time and distance have no meaning. It is like travelling across it is like travelling across a narrow isthmus to pass from one ocean to another, rather than remaining at sea and circling a continent to accomplish the same distance. Great amounts of energy are required, of course, to enter this space within space, as some call it, and a great deal of ingenious calculation must be made to ensure re-entry into ordinary space-time at the proper point. The result of the expenditure of this enemy the result of the expenditure of this energy and intelligence is that immense distances can be traversed in zero time. It is only the jump which makes interstellar travel possible. The jump we are about to make will take place in about 10 minutes. You will be warned. There is never more than some momentary minor discomfort. Therefore, I hope all of you will remain calm. Thank you. And here we get the, where the title comes from. So it says, Byron against his will. Remembered the beginning of a poem he himself had once written at the sentimental age of 19 on the occasion of his first space flight. The one that had first taken him to the earth he was now leaving. His lips moved silently. The stars like dust encircle me in the living mists of light. And all of space I seem to see in one vast burst of sight. We get this little bit of sort of very unpolitically correct, I guess, dialogue between these two characters, a father and a daughter. I have spent an evening with him, she said bitterly, and he tried to kiss me. It was disgusting. 
But everyone kisses, dear. It's not as though this were your grandmother's time of respected memory. Kisses are nothing, less than nothing. Young blood, Arthur, young blood. Young blood, my foot. The only time that horrible little man has had young blood in him these 15 years has been immediately after a transfusion. He's four inches shorter than I am, father. How can I be seen in public with a pygmy? He's an important man, very important. That doesn't add a single inch to his height. He is bow-legged, as they all are, and his breath smells. His breath smells? Artemisia wrinkled her nose at her father. That's right, it smells. It has an unpleasant odour. I didn't like it, and I let him know it. And I like this little start here to chapter 7. So, a musician of the mind. Night settles in time on all habitable planets. Not always, perhaps, at respectable interview. Not always, perhaps, at respectable intervals, since recorded periods of rotation vary from 15 to 52 hours. That fact requires the most strenuous psychological adjustment from those travelling from planet to planet. On many planets such adjustments are made, and the waking sleeping periods are tailored to fit. On many more, the almost universal use of conditioned atmospheres and artificial lighting makes the day-night question secondary except insofar as it modifies agriculture. On a few planets, those of the extremes, arbitrary divisions are made which ignore the trivial facts of light and dark. But always, whatever the social conventions, the coming of night has a deep and abiding psychological significance, dating back to man's pre-human arboreal existence. Night will always be a time of fear and insecurity, and the heart will sink with the sun. I thought this bit here was quite interesting, um, this exchange. Uh, he has not tried to hide either his travels or his return, Major. And we do not know that Widemos goes to meet him. He maintains an orbit about Lingayan. Why does he not land? Why does he maintain an orbit? Let us question what he does, and not what he does not do. And I think that's quite important. And I suppose you could also even argue, you could ask, like, why does he do nothing? Because that's still kind of doing something, especially in certain circumstances. But uh, this is something, actually, that I should call out one of my clients. I'm not going to name drop. Name drop for, I'm not going to name names or anything, but um, one of my clients... Uh, who I kind of started off ghostwriting and now mainly do editing with because they've sort of, you know, found the confidence to write themselves, which is great. But one of their things they do quite often is focus on that negative, and so, um, you know, I just think it's it's a good way of phrasing questions to be like focusing on what they are doing rather than the, what they're not doing. Thought this was a great quote here. Why the hell are planets formed anyway? Never heard of one that wasn't filled with trouble. So yeah. All in all, I did quite enjoy uh, The Stars Like Dust. Um, it's not my favourite of Asimov's books. I would describe it as it's kind of got hints of like detective novel in it, but really it's sort of a sci-fi, political, espionage thriller kind of thing set amongst the stars. I think it was a lot stronger in the first half than the second half, and it kind of almost, almost topples down under its own weight. But overall, I did enjoy it, and um, I'd give it a 3.5 out of 5. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Stars Like Dust by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.